Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Catherine, and I will be serving as your moderator. The presentation today is entitled, The Real Costs and Benefits of Open Source Data Platforms. We are honored to have as our first speaker, Tony Baer, Principal Analyst at OVUM. OVUM is a market-leading research and consulting firm focused on helping digital service providers thrive in the connected digital economy. Tony leads OVUM's Big Data Research Area, focusing on how big data must become a first-class citizen in the data center, IT organization, and the business. Joining Tony is Steve Wilkes, co-founder and CTO of Stream. Steve has served in several technology leadership roles prior to founding Stream, including heading up the Advanced Technology Group at Golden Gate Software and leading Oracle's cloud data integration strategy. Throughout the event, please feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A panel located on the right-hand side of your screen. Tony and Steve will address all questions after the presentation wraps up. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Tony Baer. Okay, thank you, Catherine. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your day to uh, join us in our discussion on the real costs and benefits of open source data platforms. Um, this is one of those perennial topics um, that we, um, where we get uh, questions from our clients. Um, and I have to basically um, give my, have, extend my gratification to the street for giving us the opportunity to, you know, come to share this discussion with you. Uh, the fact is that <clears throat> open source is obviously not a new phenomenon in the software market, but the fact is, is that in the area, especially the areas that, that I personally cover, which is data management and big data, it's just almost impossible to avoid running into open source. And so very frequently I get questions from clients about basically the reliability, the value, and the role of open source and where and uh, you know versus proprietary software. Now of course basically this uh, uh, this issue is as old, for instance, as for instance, Linux itself. I remember covering the emergence of Linux back 15, almost 20 years ago, and it thrived, and it basically proved the you know the viability of this new alternative model to software development that today is becoming more and more, at least in my area, the norm. In fact, very often, one of the first questions I ask when I uh, come across new software firms is, "Are is your um, is your?" Uh, is your content, is your, is your product available as open source? So with that said, let's take a look at what we'll be talking about over the, the next hour or so. First, we'll take a look at essentially why are we having this discussion? Why open source? What's the draw of it? Um, and then we'll cut to the chase, uh, which is really looking at the costs and benefits. And then we'll look at some real life examples where, where these costs and benefits played out. <clears throat> and then We'll then conclude with the takeaways, and spoiler alert, um, our take on this is that really is that a hybrid model that combines the innovation of open source with the reliability um, and last mile of proprietary really is the most successful model and the most viable model for enterprise software. Okay, let's go to the races here. Um, so first part is why we're having this conversation. There's no question that open source is uh, becoming more and more routine, um, you know, a routine basically occurrence in the software world. And um, Black Duck Software, which is a software firm that basically provides services that, that basically helps uh, enterprises track their licenses so they don't have any IP violations in terms of when they use, when they uh, utilize open source code. They conduct an annual survey on what they call the future of open source. They've been doing this for probably at least about the better part of a decade or so, and they uh, do this with their partner, you know, with a um, partner organization, Northbridge Partners, and they basically survey <clears throat> a you know, bunch of folks to see basically, um, to look at how open source is being used and some of the, you know, the key issues on it. And these were some of the results from the most recent survey, which was published, it was 2016, so it was published earlier this year. And it found that you know the use of open source grew 65 percent among this among this uh, sample group uh, over the past year. So pretty you know pretty significant uptick. And 
So where was most of the open source? What, what types of software did, you know, tend to be open source? What tend to be used the most? And what they found was that, and this is going to be a, a key thought to carry on through this discussion, it was basically in commodity building blocks. Um, so in areas like operating systems, I mean, vendors used to basically compete on operating systems, and then Linux essentially, the, you know, the advent of Linux really showed that that really the value add is further up in the stack. And so, of course, today, for instance, like Microsoft is no longer defined as a Windows company. So operating systems was you know, a key area, um, and probably for obvious reasons, you know, um, but also data platforms and development tools. That tend to be where you saw most of the use of open source. And then they asked the, the respondents, well, why, um, what was the driver? Why do you use open source? And the biggest reason was freedom from vendor lock-in. Now, this part, this next question, which is on participation in the open source community, this to me is an outlier, which shows that, what, that the group that, that, um, that Black Duck uh, surveyed was probably um, not representative of enterprises in general, because about two-thirds of this group basically reported that they actually contributed to open source projects. From our research, we found that most enterprises that use open source do not necessarily contribute. Um, you really, I mean, it, 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 you really couldn't scale this number out. It's not like two thirds of all, uh, two thirds of the, of the global um, 2,000 contribute. But there certainly amongst this group was a high contribution rate, high active uh, participation rate. But this next <clears throat> point. I thought was very interesting and actually potentially a cause for concern, uh, which is they asked about governance. And basically half of the companies that responded have no formal selection or approval policies for open source software. The question is, would you see the same thing with, with, uh, with conventional you know, proprietary software? And so that's an area where obviously I think, you know, obviously, um, there's still a lot of um, best practices to be, um, you, know, you know, to be learned or a lot of lessons to be learned. So anyway, um, so what has made open source successful? And, the, you know, the key watchword on this, on this slide is community. Successful open source communities breed success. That means that when you have a community of critical mass, we have enough folks that are participating in it, so it's broad enough based, and the and basically and and the activity is sufficiently critical mass that good things happen. Uh, and for instance, you know, the, among the benefits when you have a successful open source community is that community members basically get the steer. You know, it's a meritocracy. They get to steer where, you know, where the software goes. It's not a member a matter of basically hoping that a vendor you know realizes their needs or, or feels their pain and responds. No, the community basically in, in essence. You know, you know, you know, votes, you know, votes on this. At least the people who are contributors. Um, and in terms of when you have a critical mass community, um, the the velocity of code commits is very high. And along with that, with a large community, because again, you're you're tapping into what is theoretically the world's largest virtual software R and D organization. Bugs get caught, you know, tested and caught and solved a lot more quickly. So that's what happens when things work out right. Not, I mean, not all open source projects are successful, not all open source communities are successful. But on this page, we have a few examples, some of the poster children that really, you know, that really um, you know, made, this, made this myth reality. Uh, Linux is the obvious one. That's really kind of the grandfather. Linux is actually the exception that, that proves the rule, which is that Linux, even though it was a community, had basically someone at the top who had just pretty much I won't say unquestioned moral authority, but basically very widely accepted moral authority. It's pretty unusual. But the rest of these projects like Apache Hadoop and Apache Spark, also very broad-based communities and tend to you know, you know, be better examples of this model in practice. So the great debate here, why open source, why proprietary? Now, the, the why open source, on, you know, those points on the left basically were the chief points that were identified in that black duck, you know, uh, software survey. And again, it, it kind of, you know, reinforces what we said on the previous page, which is that why do, you know, why do companies use, you know, why do enterprises use open source? Because basically they perceive that when an open source project is successful, that the quality will be better. 
the, the, the code quality will be better. They also feel that basically that the features will be competitive because it is vetted by the community, so therefore there is a popular, um, you know, there is definitely a groundswell, a critical mass market that wants and needs these features and will therefore be motivated, incented to basically improve and fix them. Um, and of course, along with that, you know, because essentially open source, you're not, you're, you're not restricted by basically a vendor license where they own the source code is that you have the ability to fix it and customize it you know to your well and of course it's going to depend on the open source license there are dozens of them out there but in general uh if you look at some of the more most popular licenses today that tend to be patterned off of the apache license which allows you to add basically you know, value add on top of the open source code um that pretty much is the case now why proprietary well in many cases, open source projects by their very nature are going to be very narrow and specific. And so therefore, they're not necessarily unified solutions. You have to put the pieces together. That's what vendors do. And in turn, they have you know, their unique intellectual property. But also, what's very important is that they provide accountability. So it's essentially, they give you, a, you know, a one throat to choke, so to speak. Also, as they put together a solution, then therefore basically they you know they're ultimately accountable for security and chances are um you know with vendor software the security you know should theoretically you know be, you know uh, cover all of the you know functionality you know in in that particular software product there's also perceived customer focus that basically successful software companies basically you know follow their customers now again when you look at these points, there are always going to be exceptions to every rule. The world is not black and white. But these are essentially the debating points between open source and proprietary. So one other point, though, which was not in, you know, that was not actually uh, among the top responses from the Black Duck survey, is that a lot of folks believe that with open source that it's going to uh, provide them cost savings. A good example of this is that I, I had a field as a query from one of our enterprise clients. They were based out in Singapore. I think they were like a big banking institution. This is like about four or five years ago. And it was when Hadoop was still new, and the perception was Hadoop is open source, so it's free. And so this client asked me, well, you know, um, you know, they were looking at what type of packages would work on open source, and I went through the query with them. But I asked them then what was driving this. They said, well, we would like to get rid of our, our, our Oracle software because Hadoop is free. I said, well, not exactly. And they said, you know, who are you going to have to maintain this? They said, well, we're going to hire consultants. And so basically what a lot of the rest of this discussion about is going to be basically, you know, we're going to talk about the perceived cost savings, but we'll then look at what savings are real and what costs are real. And so, cut to the chase here. What do we think is the answer? Um, well, what we found from our experience um, in looking at open source software products is that the best recipe for success typically is a hybrid type of model. Very often, it, you know, it's, you know, it used to be called open core, where the core of the technology or the kernel would be open source, but then around it, the vendor would surround it with their own value add. And some of the advantage of that, well, of course, there's a value here. There's a value to the vendor that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. A good example of that is um, are the folks who are sponsoring this call, Stream. Um, they have basically a hybrid solution. Um, and you know, when it came, for instance, you know, you know, time to you know to choose a messaging system or to develop messaging, they realized, well, that technology already exists in open source, and that is not part of their core value add. So rather than spend their time having to reinvent a messaging system, they chose zero MQ. Um, it also gives you the chance to leverage commodity infrastructure, as a lot of open source uh, software, you know, typically is designed to do today. Um, another. Another good advantage of this model is that it gives you know both you know the vendor and and the enter and the customer the chance to harness the innovation that's that's coming from the open source community, especially you know with the latest common building blocks. Also, and this is very important, not just to the vendor but also to the customer. But it's commercial viability, in that. Um, it's kind of like uh, it's a, you know the the metaphor I'm thinking of here is the surgery was successful but the patient died. Well, maybe you have great software, but the vendor is giving you such a great deal they can't make money on it. 
ultimately it's not going to be of much value to you because if that vendor is not viable, you're not going to have anybody to support it. So ultimately, it is in not just the vendor's interest to be commercially viable, but it's also in the customer's interest. And so basically this is where the role of unique IP becomes very critical and also becomes very critical because the vendor is best, um, uh, is best situated uh, to deliver that enterprise-grade you know, support. Uh, then there's also what we call the last mile of functionality. And that's where, for instance, you have these common building blocks, but at the end you need to do that integration, like with Stream. They did that integration with Oracle at the log level to do that change data capture. That's not the type of thing that's going to be very viable for an open source community because that's going to be a very narrow purpose project. Uh, and so, therefore, you need to go narrow but deep there. That does not suit itself to open source. So those, again, that basically is why we see the hybrid model being most viable, and we'll return back to this. It really does give you the best of both worlds. So given that, they're not all open source projects are alike. And at the risk of, or, uh, of oversimplifying, guilty as charged, we are oversimplifying here. We've basically shown two ends of the spectrum, because you know, there are many different types of models. On one end is the vendor-led, on the other end is the community side. And the vendor-led is basically where the vendor essentially own, you know, ba you know, basically puts the source code out, out on someplace like GitHub. But the vendor ultimately basically leads that project. It's not, own, you know, it's not governed by any type of community. Then there's the other side, you know, the other extreme, which is the community-led where it's, you know, hosted by a foundation such as Apache. They're pretty much the gold standard of open source communities. So what's basically the difference? In the vendor, you know, in the, in the technology vendor-led project, and a good example of that, you know, would be say, say something like MongoDB, is that the vendor essentially makes the roadmap decisions on where the product goes. Um, um, whereas in the community side, the community basically it's a, merit, it's a meritocracy. Now, that being said, reality is not black and white. In that, we've noticed that a number of vendors that have, you know, basically, you know, led their own projects have also you know, started to basically dabble in community, on the community side as, as well. And, and the same is, is, is true with, with vendors who basically deal with community projects. And very often, actually, um, a vendor might lead a project initially kind of in their own phase, of, you know, their own matter of kind of like incubation. The difference, basically, is that vendor-led open source products in many ways are like proprietary software products. The difference here, though, is that the code and the roadmaps are publicly are, are publicly available. That's basically the difference. Again, it's not to say that one model is better than the other. You know, for instance, for MongoDB and its customers, that the vendor-led model works very well. For Spark, Hadoop, you know, Linux, the community model was 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 you know was, you know you know proved quite you know quite successful. So now let's basically <clears throat> look a little more in detail. At the cost and savings, and we'll start. We'll start with the good news, and um, kind of like paraphrasing the old Meineke muffler commercial. And yeah, I originally had a better picture here, but the but the quality was crappy. <laughs> so we'll go with the screaming babies. But I'm not going to pay a lot for this software. Um, the, the thing with thought with open source is that. The cost model changes. You don't pay for the software itself, so it doesn't matter how much software you use um, or download. Um, you know, you're not paying a, a perpetual license or subscription for the software itself. On the other hand, open source software, just because you can get that software free, doesn't mean open source software is free. It's freely available, but it's not free. In one way or another, you're going to pay. You know, and the preferred model is where basically you go with a commercial open source you know, provider that, that packages a distribution and does all the integration of all the open source modules and hopefully does some of that last mile stuff. And there basically the typical model is that you pay a subscription for support. That's actually a fairly familiar model because it's kind of like proprietary software where you're paying, it's kind of like the annual maintenance part of what you do with proprietary software. The only difference is you're not paying that upfront cost of capital cost of, per, of a perpetual license. For vendors, the, the savings are that it avoids reinventing wheels. We mentioned before, and we gave the example with Stream and with their, their use of an open source messaging you know, technology as part of their solution. Um, for enterprises, as mentioned, there's no perpetual licensing, no, and so therefore you eliminate that, uh, that upfront capital cost. 
You're taking advantage typically of commodity technology. Most open source gets popular because the technology is affordable and it works on affordable technology. You know, you know, you know, uh, typically, for instance, like you know, x86 machines, for instance. And along with that, there are it has basically you know altered pricing expectations, and that's kind of where that picture kind of comes in. Um, I talked to the Hadoop folks, and they would love to you know be able to get the multiples, you know, charge the multiples that like all the enterprise software folks, like the Microsofts and the Oracles of the world, you know, have historically charged. But realistically, their market is not going to put up with that. And so, while we see the Hadoop market as being in the few hundreds of millions, uh, it's nowhere close to the, the existing enterprise database market, which is in which is well north of 10 billion. Um, um, and, you know, even as Hadoop, for instance, matures, it will never get to that 10 billion mark, basically because the community expects or the customer base expects the lower cost software. Um, however, what we need to point out, and we're going to talk about this more on the next page, on the next slide on the terms of cost, is that the savings picture is going to differ between whether you use what we call raw open source where you're going directly to the community website and downloading those packages or projects versus whether you basically subscribe to a vendor, um, you know, with support distributions. As you mentioned down here, when you typically subscribe to an open source software vendor, most of them, the vast majority of them are actually uh, following the hybrid open core model, by the way. Uh, there is some proprietary technology there. Anyway, okay, so let's go into those costs. We're going to look at it from the standpoint of raw open source. Where you go to, you know, the, the project site, you, buy, you, you don't bother going to a vendor, you don't pay for a distribution, uh, or you don't pay um, subscription, you know, uh, for distribution. And here, basically, the picture is very similar to that of basically implementing your own homegrown software. The only difference is you didn't write the original software. You're probably going to be running a lot of other stuff as a result of this, but that's another story. But the advantage, of course, is that you get the flexibility of dealing with it, what's in essence a best-of-breed strategy because you're picking and choosing your open source projects, but you're also bearing the integration costs as well. Security is going to vary by open source project. It's going to be more complete in some than others, and for instance, you know, some security technologies, you know, some security projects may not necessarily support all the open source projects that you want to um, that you want to implement. So a key headache for basically uh, you know organizations that basically go this raw you know you know open source in the wild download route is that you need to harmonize the security and integrate all the pro and integrate all the software. By the way, there's also the fear of obsolescence. I'll admit it's not exclusive to open source because you can basically get you know a vendor product and that vendor goes out of business. Well, that's all she wrote. The same thing can happen in open source. Just because you know, the software is still up there on a website doesn't mean that it's not been put out onto, uh, onto extended life support um, or end of life support, I should say. Uh, and so this is very typical of the growing pains of maturing technologies because some are going to be winners and some are going to be not. In that sense, you're making bets that are very similar with proprietary software as well, but it's not something that people, I think, really think very heavily about with open source because they think, well, it's free, so what am I risking? You are, there is something at risk there. Um, and then there's the, the question of extensibility, which is that because many open source projects are very narrow in scope, um, that they'll require additional functionality. And so we're going to go into a few real life examples here to kind of bear out what we're talking about here. And this is the case of a bank that implemented a cybersecurity solution. Then they put it up. They in, in, then they basically they went the route of basically of de of basically going to open source projects in the wild. And so they uh, implemented you know NiFi, which is a data flow routing um, you know uh, open source open source project. Then with Storm for streaming and Metron for security analytics, and Kibana, which goes along with, you know, which actually is related to Elasticsearch, so basically it's for visualizing log analytics. They um, also had a, a GUI, alert, alert, alert UI, and ElastAlert. What I'm actually surprised I don't see up here is, is Elasticsearch. I would have presumed that would be part of it as well. Um, but anyway, um, this was essentially, you know, putting together a bunch of these projects. The only difference between this and homegrown software is they didn't write the original projects, but they otherwise had to bear the full load of having to integrate all this stuff and patch it. And it basically, this was, you know, this cybersecurity solution was not trivial. It required about 45 engineers, and it cost them about 20, 30 million to basically maintain, keep this working over about five or six year period. 
And the big, you know, the, the real pain points there were there were the gaps, you know, at the last mile, especially with end-to-end -end security, which required that custom, you know, last mile development. Another example is a, is a communication service provider and trying to um, extend a call center application. And so they used several open source projects, Flume for data in motion for routing data, routing data flow essentially, Logstash, which is for collecting and transforming log, log data, and Elasticsearch. Hey, we found it here. Didn't leave it off the list. And this was actually a much more modest solution. Five practitioners, you know, just quite five practitioners, cost in the neighborhood of three million plus or minus over five or six years. Uh, key gaps here, though, again, were that last mile, which is with change data capture integration with the customer databases. It's with a call center, basically. You want to know what's basically the, you know, what's happening with the customer. And that required a lot of costly extra development and a lot of costly maintenance. And our last example here is dealing with unplanned adolescence. This is a credit card processing firm that was doing, had a real-time transaction processing application. And in this case, again, this was a very, this was, uh, on the surface, this looked like a, a very successful quick hit. Um, they used Spring XD, which is a component for building data pipelines, and it was, you know, I mean, it was very quick to implement, just a couple months, you know, not that many engineers. So on the face of it, it served their purposes for what they were doing. Um, uh, Problem is, is that the vendor uh, pulled the plug on it uh, when they went to a, a different strategy. And so the vendor placed Spring XD project on end of life. And as a result of that, you know, the, um, the credit card company was back, you know, was back at square one. Um, and so, and again, as I said, I will say the same problem can happen with proprietary software as well. But I think the important point here is that just because it's open source, because you don't have a, you know, doesn't mean that it's going to uh, that's going to be successful. And in this case, actually, just like you depend on a vendor for you know for for you know for product mode routes for proprietary software, well, this is the case of a vendor-led open source project. And in this case, the vendor pulled the plug. So, what tends to work with open source? As we said it basically works best with commodity technology, which draws a critical mass target audience of developers and prospective customers. You've got to serve a wide enough market to build a big enough community. Um, it ha and that also the technology is extensible and the licensing is extensible. And that's where, as I said, the Apache license has proven uh, very popular because it does allow you to add um, your own value add atop the open source. It doesn't require you to to you know, give it back to the open source. I mean, like a lot of the earlier, like the like the Gen One licenses, like the, the, the you know the uh, like the GPL you know, licenses, which were the original licenses um, in the open source world. Um, and but deal is is that uh, what you're looking at, and again, it's got to be critical mass technology. So it's not written for an overly narrow use case, and it's not hardwired to any specific platform. Um, and the APIs are published and freely available, and they're open. <clears throat> and ideally, if you have those open APIs, hopefully you can avoid best-of-breed integration issues. Um, but again, that's another reason why we, we believe the, you know, the hybrid model is best. We'll get to that in a sec, or get back to that in a sec. But where do we see proprietary software? Where does proprietary um, IP really come in? Well, where we really see it happening is especially at the application and business logic level. Now, of course, to every rule, there are exceptions. Yes, there is Sugar CRM, a customer relationship management system. But for the most part, we've not seen a lot of open source at the application level. And there's really a, uh, a good reason for that, which is that that's where businesses want to differentiate themselves in terms of how they do business. And so do you want to basically, uh, even though obviously we have application software that has kind of commoditized this a bit, um, the, 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 you know, the differentiation is too specific to really make it well suited for an open source project. I mean, you don't want to get a lowest common denominator solution for your business. Um, we've also found it's very good for niche technologies and solutions where basically the market, the addressable market is too small, and therefore the addressable community of developers is going to be too small to really support an open source project, such as doing, let's say, a connector to a data, you know, a connector to a, to a, log, to a logging system of a database. And that again ties into the last one of unique and custom integration use cases. So, 
What we see here is that proprietary IP is best for differentiating enterprise solutions, also good for end-to-end -end security because basically a, you know, a vendor can basically take charge of making sure all those gaps are, are filled. It's, that's going to be kind of, it's going to come basically kind of hit or miss when you have a community. Also, uh, this also polished user experiences and UIs, and I think it's not because you can't open source that. I think it's probably because of the danger of developers that I don't really think they really, they think in terms of functionality, you know, maybe I'm guilty of some stereotypes here, but we've just not seen user experience as being the type of thing that you hope that's open source. And yes, we do see some GUIs on a various open source projects, but the really polished ones, I think, it's, it's really, uh, that's really where the vendor comes in and keep and you know, with the exception of let's say certain categories of products, like where Apple made its, its name, UI is usually not the um is not the uh you know you know you know, I guess the you know, the showstopper. And also again, last mile of integration and consistent SLAs. That's where you're really gonna count on a vendor to really make sure that essentially the trains run on time and that and also that all the tracks connect. Anyway, so in general we believe that using hybrid open core for solutions where last mile is differentiated intellectual property, but at the same time you get to get the best of both worlds by leveraging community building blocks. It's essentially where commodity meets enterprise grade. And so the takeaways in all this is that, you know, we're not saying don't use open source, we're saying use open source where it's appropriate. But when you do so, keep your eyes open. It's open source is not synonymous with free. So look at the real cost. Commercially, and you're either going to pay that cost either through subscriptions with commercially supported, um, you know, annual subscriptions, which is very much like paying maintenance for, for conventional software. And it's all, or you're going to be paying for it in terms of all the spade work you have to do when you implement raw open source out in the wild. It's a lot like doing, again, your homegrown software. Hybrid open core approach we found to be the most reliable and the most viable model for enterprise software because we said it combines the best of both worlds. It keeps the vendor in business, which means that it keeps it gives you the assurance that you're going to have a vendor there, a throat to choke, and someone there to support your software. Um, but yet it also taps the rapid innovation of the open source community, the, com the economies of, of commodity software, but yet at the same time you get that unique IP and last mile integration and security. So that pretty much wraps up my part of the, of the conversation. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Steve. Well, thank you, Tony. I'm going to uh, start by introducing uh, Stream, talk a little bit about our platform, and doing that to provide context for the discussion around uh, open source and this hybrid open source model. Uh, because you know, Stream, as, as a company building our platform, like any intelligent software company, if it's been built already, then why build it again? We go into the discussions around that and how important it was to integrate a uh, piece of open source into the platform. So Stream has been around for around five years now. We have a mature technology that's been uh, in production with customers for more than three years, and we are continually uh, evolving and releasing new updates to the platform, um, adding new uh, functionality, new connectors, etc. And Stream uh, provides a full end-to-end -end streaming data integration and analytics platform. So what the platform does in a nutshell is allow you to collect data continually from a whole variety of enterprise sources, um, things that may be inherently streaming, like message buses and sensors that can send you data in, in real time. And then things that you may not think of as streaming, like files, for example. Um, so with files, you, you know, we will collect the data at the end, end of the file as it's written and stream that out in real time. And then databases, most people think of those as a historical record of what's happened in the past. But we use uh, change data capture technology to see what's happening in the database in real time, get those inserts, updates, and deletes as they're happening, and stream those out. So once you've done continuous data collection, you have real-time in-memory data streams. And the simplest thing you can do with the platform is just deliver that somewhere else. So from a streaming integration perspective, you can take stuff that's being written into a database, for example, and stream that out onto Kafka or take your weblog files from on-premise and stream those out into uh, Amazon S3 or Azure SQL DB in the cloud. That's kind of the simple thing you can do with the platform. But typically, our customers are doing more than that. 
and that requires some degree of processing. So we have this ability to do in-memory SQL-based continuous queries that can process that data and analyze that data. And this, in conjunction with uh, time series windows and an in-memory data grid, allow you to do things like uh, transforming the data uh, from one form to another, uh, filtering it, uh, aggregating it, so uh, looking at you know the last minute's worth of data or the last hundred events and the last entry for each one of these records, etc. And also enriching the data, and that's where the in-memory data grid comes in because you'll need to load large amounts of data into memory, reference data, and then join that with the streaming data in real time as things are passing through. So that's kind of how you can process data and get it into a form you want before delivering it. An example would be if you're reading change data from your nicely normalized database and say it's an order detail table, you're just going to see a whole bunch of IDs, you know, order ID this, customer ID this, item ID this. And if you're just delivering that out to say Kafka, that's not going to mean much to the people reading the data from Kafka. So enrichment typically will be you'll load reference data into memory and then join that. And so now instead of those IDs, you get the order information, the customer information, the item information, that's all written out. And so you can now do more intelligent analytics. And talking of analytics, we have the capability of doing um, in-memory statistical analysis, and anomaly detection, uh, pattern detection through a complex event processing syntax, and correlation across data streams and across windows. And this uh, enables you to look for things that happen at the same point of time or within a, ra a time range. And also to uh, look for things that are co-located in, in the same geographic location, for example. So doing this correlation is an important aspect of almost all of the analytics use cases that we see. And then on top of all of this processing that, as I mentioned, is happening through the SQL-based queries, you can then build uh, visualizations all using our platform, so real-time dashboards. You can trigger uh, workflows. You can generate alerts uh, to notify people that things are happening. And we have ways of integrating third-party machine learning directly into the streaming data flows as well for real-time scoring and inference. That's basically what the platform does. It's a in-memory streaming integration and analytics platform that does everything from continuous data collection, processing, analytics, and delivery. And this suits different categories of use cases. It's a piece of middleware that enables you to do a whole bunch of different things. So on the real-time data integration side, we have customers that are delivering data real-time into a data lake, for example, after processing it and getting it into a form they want, or uh, integrating on-premise and cloud, keeping a cloud database up to date with an on-premise database for hybrid cloud initiatives, or doing IoT edge processing. On, on top of that, we have the analytics type of applications where your customers are doing things like uh, fraud detection or uh, cybersecurity monitoring where you're analyzing lots of different data feeds uh, and anti-money laundering and location-based uh, solutions where you know people move locations really really quickly so you need to have real-time insight into what's happening and that's where a streaming platform really comes into play because you can process the data as it's being produced and then we have the customers that have built dashboards and this is typically used for uh, building and monitoring real-time metrics and key performance indicators in order to do real-time quality monitoring, uh, SLA monitoring, et cetera. And these use cases cross many, many industries. I'm not going to go into all of these because that would take up another couple of hours. But you know, we have use cases across lots of different industries, and you know, we touch lots of different departments within those organizations as well. The key differentiators of our platform are that it is a full end-to-end -end platform that does everything from collection, processing, analytics, delivery, and visualization of real-time data, that it's designed to be easy to use, so it's very fast to build and deploy these applications. We have you know, a UI for drag-and-drop building of data flows. We have this SQL-like language that enables you to uh, use a whole bunch of different types of uh, your your internal resources, whether they're developers or business analysts or data scientists, to actually build out these data flows. We are enterprise grade, and that means that we are inherently clustered, scalable, uh, 
reliable with you know, fault tolerance and exactly when it's processing and recovery built into the platform. And we have end-to-end -end security. And we can integrate with a whole bunch of things. You know, so we work with the top three uh, cloud platforms, uh, the top three big data platforms. We have change data capture for the major databases. We have deep integration with Apache Kafka and other uh, open source solutions. So that's kind of the platform in a nutshell. And it's kind of important to kind of understand that within the context of how this works with open source. So now imagine you didn't have Stream and you needed to build a streaming data uh, framework or platform from open source. And this is kind of the process that we went through as well. So we're talking from experience here in how do you build such a platform? Well, uh, inherently, you're going to be taking data from sources, moving it to targets, and doing stuff in the middle. And as I mentioned, that stuff can be quite complex. And it requires a lot of different categories uh, of software. And so in order to move data around a cluster, you have uh, a high-speed message infrastructure. In order to load large amounts of reference data into memory, you need a distributed in-memory data grid or a cache. To store the results, you need distributed result storage. And then you have data collection, data delivery, and the processing of the data. You have to have some way of developing the solutions and visualizing the solutions. Those are all the different categories of open source that you need. And we'll just add a few in here so you can get an idea that every single one of these categories has you know, a large number of different pieces of open source that you can choose from. And that isn't the end game, right? Those are just some pieces that you need. And in order to get it all to work, you need some glue code around all of this to handle all of the enterprise grade stuff, the clustering, scalability, reliability, security, and management that enables all these pieces to work together and to uh, scale together, to be reliable together, to a single security policy across all of them. And then you need uh, a layer that enables your developers to actually build the applications, because this is just the, the framework, the platform. Um, there's no solutions yet. So um, the goal of this as an enterprise would be that you're building something that enables people to build analytics uh, or integration much more quickly. And so you need uh, abstraction layer and API connectivity and a you know, web server and things like that. Yeah, so that's all the pieces. And that's kind of the pieces that we looked at as well when we were uh, building our, our platform. And so if you look at the process involved in that, uh, if you're going to build this from, from open source, uh, first of all, you need to design it. We, we just did that. We had uh, a diagram that showed the various pieces that we were looking at. You go deeper than that in reality, but that's you know, a, an idea. And then for each component of open source that you're interested in, you have to look at the different options. So identify what open source is available in each of the categories and evaluate each one. You may have performance requirements, scalability requirements, overhead requirements, uh, even you know, software language requirements. You know, I want everything to be Java. I want everything to be JavaScript. And it's kind of hard to mix the two. Then you need to build the integration and build the glue code and the layers around all of that. As you're integrating things, you might find that some things don't work together. So you may have to go and identify a different component that you're going to use. Then you go into testing. And of course, testing might result in changes and might result in you having to change things up because things don't work. Once you have this built, um, you're going to have to maintain it. And some of the things that Tony mentioned, um, yeah, if the, the open source software that you've chosen is upgraded in some way um, and it changes its APIs. And you know, thankfully, you know, Kafka is now finally out of beta. It's a 1.0 uh, after all this time. Uh, but up until now, the APIs were changing all the time. And so every upgrade you went, every version you went, you may have to modify all of your integration code to work with the new APIs. And the other case that Tony mentioned was the open source is deprecated. Maybe they're not going to fix any bugs in, in, anymore. There's no contribu contributors left. They've all moved on to the next big thing. Um, in that case, you may just have to replace your piece of open source, which means you now have to identify a new one. And that goes through the evaluation process and the reintegration process. So you have to do all of that um, and also get support if there are any bugs that you find and go to the community or the vendor to fix things. And you need to do all of that um, before you can start to build your applications. 
Um, and so that's quite an involved process, and that's why you talk about these large time frames that are involved in a lot of these open source projects. So you're talking, you know, even with something basic, you know, six months to a year before you can even start to get any results out of it. You know, whereas if you download that platform, we've done all this already. And so you're literally just installing Stream, and then you can start building the applications. And you talk to our support, and we will manage all of the issues with all of the open source that we include. Uh, that enables you to kind of build your applications faster and get to deployment faster. If we look at what our platform looks like and how we've integrated open source, now we have things at the edge. You know, so we have sources and targets in our platform um, that integrate with open source pieces, including Kafka, HDFS, Flume, HBase, Hive, etc. All the things you'd expect if you're reading data or writing data somewhere. But then we also have pieces of open source within our platform. And we went through that identification and evaluation process in order to choose the, the best of breed in all these cases and, and integrate them together. Um, we have two different versions of messaging. We have a high-speed messaging that runs at network speed that utilizes uh, GeoMQ, it's the Java version of ZeroMQ and Cryo. We have a persistent high-speed message infrastructure uh, for recovery purposes and application decoupling purposes. We use Kafka for that. It's built into the product, ships with the product. We have Hazelcast that manages uh, clustering, um, metadata management and control. We have an implementation of a, a Jcash in-memory data grid for high-speed uh, lookups and very fine-grained control over where data is stored um, across a cluster. And we utilize Elastic, uh, Tony will be happy that I mentioned Elastic again, uh, for distributed result storage. So those are all the pieces of open source that we, we have chosen. Um, there are a lot more supporting classes that I couldn't possibly fit in here, you know, like a Jackson JSON parser, for example. Um, and there's you know, lots more of those, um, but you know, they're not kind of major, major components that you know, are their own software category by themselves. Um, then, of course, we built all of the glue code. So we had to work out how do we do scalability, the distributed technology, clustering, failover across all of these pieces so they all work together. Uh, how do we manage reliability and exactly one's processing all the way from sources to targets? Uh, how do we have a single security policy, role-based security and encryption across all of these things? And uh, full management and monitoring uh, interface, uh, APIs, UI, uh, that enables you to control this as a whole platform rather than individual pieces. We have a full set of uh, APIs, whether they're uh, through our scripting language, JDBC, ODBC, REST APIs, and WebSockets APIs uh, that enable you to connect with the platform. But then we also have a whole bunch of secret source that are the pieces that enable the continuous data collection, whether it's from uh, devices, big data databases, et cetera, through change data capture, um, and continuous data delivery, um, all those things that you see on the other side. And then the real key is the SQL-based processing and analytics, which is our own uh, intellectual property um, that allows you to do the filtering, transform, aggregation, enrichment, um, do complex event processing, anomaly detection, and cor correlation. And that's you know, a piece of the platform that you know, we currently hold a patent for. And as Tony mentioned, you know, on top of that, you very seldom see uh, UIs, either in open source software or even within an enterprise. Not many enterprises that are building a data processing platform are going to take the time to build a drag and drop UI or a command line interface or some other easy way to actually build the applications. They're gonna rely on developers to write code to build the applications. So we provide a drag and drop UI for building data flows, um, doing all the analytics, and for building the dashboards and surfacing all of that. So that's kind of how we incorporate open source into our platform, but our customers don't have to worry about it. And if one of these pieces was decommissioned, it was no longer supported, or there were major bugs in it, then we handle that for the customer. They don't have to have developers on call, the, that $3 million spent to keep people uh, maintaining and upgrading the, the platform continually. You know, so our unique IP includes this change data capture, 
that enables you to get data from databases in real time as it's happening and also enables you to handle things like changes in schema. So if a table structure changes, then we can modify how we write things out to Hadoop or Kafka, for example. Uh, In-memory distributed processing, which is a patented technology that enables you to uh, have this SQL-based processing happening across a cluster and intelligently route things across the cluster and join things with this uh, distributed cache and handle uh, fault tolerance and exactly one's processing um, with rollback and recovery uh, that enables you to uh, scale the applications and also trust that they're going to work and pick up where they left off if, you know, for example, you lost the entire cluster. Um, so these are some key things that we've added in and on top of that, our kind of UI and dashboard builder, they, as we mentioned, you rarely get from open source. Um, we are recognized by the industry for doing a lot of innovative work, uh, both on kind of streaming analytics and on IoT, and they're also a great place to work and we're very happy about that one. Just very quickly, um, drill down into a couple of these uh, customer stories. Uh, uh, we have a, a customer that's built out a uh, anti-piracy solution. Um, this is for um, video feeds, et cetera, and, and media customers. And it enables kind of real-time monitoring of the usage of uh, feeds and of media and correlates multiple logs uh, in real time in order to identify uh, is a person really a subscriber or not. And why did they choose us? Well, they looked at uh, a number of different open source log analytics products um, and they had some concerns about you know, the amount of people that it would involve to maintain it. Um, they estimated that if they hadn't used that platform, they would have had to have triple the size of the team uh, to actually do the development and ongoingly maintain and keep the, the platform up to date. Um, and also some kind of limitations with your know, single open source solutions that they could have chosen for this um, and kind of the integration that they needed to do. Um, so we were chosen because we had, in addition to the log uh, capture, uh, change data capture from the Oracle database, we have this SQL processing language that enabled them to use what they wouldn't ordinarily have thought of as developers, people in the analytics team, uh, to kind of build out some of the data flows. And we had this great visualization that they could use for monitoring and uh, we could easily integrate with their existing code that they had for a machine learning solution. A second case is a leading credit card network. And what they needed to do was to very quickly identify potential threats. And you know, if you have lots and lots of security applications out there, you know, a large number of different types of security logs, you're gonna end up with alerts from all of them. And if you get an alert, security analysts will have to manually drill down and correlate and look at um, what else is happening. So if you get a port scan from a certain IP address, what else is that IP address doing? And they would have to manually co correlate and look across a whole bunch of different logs. So they're using our platform to pre-correlate across all the logs and identify things that have activity in more than one place with certain rules around that that enable them to identify high priority potential threats and act on those much more quickly, uh, reducing the amount of time that the analysts spend uh, looking at data. Because we pre-correlate all the data, um, it really enables them to very quickly see everything that they need in order to make decisions. And they chose us because um, they, they you know, tried things before. They built a, a Python application that did things with a four hour window, so they're always four hours behind, um, and they wanted this information as soon as possible in real time. They looked at two different types of open source. Um, one of them, the, the one that they worked on t first, that was the story that Tony told that got de-supported after they spent a year of development, unfortunately. So they then you know, looked again at options. One of the open source things that they did the identification and evaluation and testing, that one didn't scale. Um, as they needed. They were talking about 10 billion events a day uh, they need to process and they just couldn't get that performance out of this other piece of open source. Um, and it also didn't have all the required features they needed. And they chose us because we had this uh, necessary scalability 
and also SQL-based processing and analytics so they could build out these data flows and update them and build additional applications really quickly. So you know, key takeaways really are that you know, this blended approach does all that work that you would need to do to identify and evaluate and choose and integrate and maintain um, all of those bits of open source and provides it all for you without you having to worry about it, abstract it away so that you can use it very easily. But also a key integrates with open source that you may have chosen already. So um, if you already have your own Kafka cluster, you don't have to use the one we ship with. We can integrate with that um, as if it was ours. Um, if you already have Hadoop, we can read and write from that for you. Um, but you know, our solution is also enterprise grade and you can get started much faster and more cost efficiently. And you know, we basically take the best of open source that we have chosen, that we have gone through all that process and bundle it with our unique IP that you know, offers this patented technology for real-time integration and analytics provides you the UI for building everything, the ease of use, end-to-end -end security, reliability, and scalability, and gives you this ability to build dashboards and visualizations in a single platform. So that's the end of my part of the presentation, and we will now open it up for the Q&A. Thanks so much, Steve and Tony. I'd like to remind everyone to submit your questions via the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of your screen. While we're waiting, I'll mention that a link to the recording of today's webinar will be emailed to you within the next day or so. Feel free to share this link with your colleagues. Now let's turn to our questions. Our first question is, does CDC need to be turned on in the database for Stream to handle CDC from it? That's a great question, and the answer is yes. Um, but we can help you with that. You know, so. Uh, different databases have different requirements for enabling uh, change data capture. You know, Oracle, for example, needs supplemental logging turned on. Um, MySQL requires you have a bin log, uh, et cetera. Um, but if you're using our platform, you're using, uh, you are using our wizards, when you make that initial connection into the database, we will check all of that for you, and we will tell you if you don't have the correct things configured, and if you don't, what you need to do in order to achieve that. So um, it does have to be turned on, but we can help you with it. Great, thanks. Our next question, um, when it comes to real-time data integration, how does Stream differ with other products in the market? Um, I, what you've just seen in the presentation, hopefully. Um, if we, we are a full end-to-end -end platform, right? So um, we can do real-time integration, and other people talk about real-time integration as well. Um, you know, there are solutions out there that can do change data capture into Kafka, right? Uh, but if you look a little bit underneath the covers, what they mean is that they are doing change data capture and they're writing exactly that data into Kafka. Um, there's no uh, processing available, there's no uh, enrichment, there's no uh, advanced features available w within that. You know, so um, because people talk about real-time integration, streaming integration kind of as a marketing piece doesn't mean that they're necessarily doing everything that you need in order to actually achieve that. You know, so it's really our completeness that is the big differentiator, that we have all these data sources to turn virtually anything into a data stream. We have all of the processing in SQL. You don't need developers to write Java code or JavaScript or C Sharp to actually do all of the processing of the data. We have a lot of different data targets, and you can take one source, say CDC, and push that into Kafka, uh, cloud database, uh, blob storage, and Hadoop, all within a single data flow. You don't, you know, it's, it's very easy to build these things out, and we have um, some some of that, some videos out on that as well. You know, so um, it, it's really the completeness of the platform, and plus, because you now have things streaming, if you want to move to do real-time analytics, you're perfectly positioned to do that, and our platform can help you with that too. Excellent, thanks, Steve. Our next question, does Stream take care of upgrades of all the underlying open source technologies? For example, if I upgrade to the latest Stream version, I, I get the 
latest compatible open source technologies? So um, it it depends on kind of the integration point, right? So if you're talking about sources and targets, things that we connect to, then we are always trying to keep up to date with uh, whatever it is our customers are requiring and that it may not be the last, last version of everything. Um, it, it could be the previous to last. It really depends on what has got market traction, but we will always you know, support our customers and ensure that they can connect with whatever they have already. Um, if it's something that is an integral part of our platform that is completely hidden from customers, um, we have our own mechanisms by which we choose when to upgrade, um, and it obviously depends on kind of stability, security, amount of uh, API changes, uh, integration effort, etc. So we may not always be shipping with the last release of something within our platform, but we're going to keep things current because we obviously want to take advantage of any bug fixes and security fixes that have gone in. You know, and if customers point, point something out to us and they're concerned, for example, about a, a security hole in one of the pieces that we incorporate, um, then that's obviously something that we can uh, patch and fix quickly. So the, uh, that was a long answer. The short answer is it depends. Perfect. I think that also addresses our next question. I regret that we're out of time. Uh, if we did not get to your specific question, we will follow up with you directly within the next few hours. On behalf of Tony and Steve, I would like to thank you again for joining us for today's discussion. Have a great rest of your day.